Our new book, The Art of Business Wars, features stories and lessons from history's greatest business rivalries, with powerful insights uncovered through hundreds of episodes of Business Wars. Go to Wondery.com forward slash The Art of Business Wars to order your copy now. Join Wondery Plus to listen to Business Wars one week early and ad-free in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. A note to listeners, this episode contains adult content and language. It's summer 1897 outside Henryville, Indiana, a small town 100 miles south of Indianapolis. Seven-year-old Harlan Sanders carefully reaches into the hot oven. With a towel in each grubby hand, he takes out the first loaf of bread he's ever baked all by himself. He's barefoot and bare-chested, with a bushy head of red hair. He lets the bread cool for a while, just like his mother does, and then cuts off slices to give to his younger sister and brother. Harlan takes care of his siblings every day while his mother works at a canning factory. His father died two years ago. Three-year-old Catherine gobbles the bread down. Harlan, this is so good. Let's show Mama. Harlan packs up the rest of the bread and grabs his five-year-old brother's hand. Together, they half lead, half carry their sister the three dusty miles to the factory. The children enter the factory, thrumming with the sounds of milling machines and conveyor belts. The women on the canning line spot the three children first. A young woman with a red bandana over her hair recognizes the tired, sweaty kids. Why, you're Margaret Sanders, little ones. My goodness, what are you doing all the way over here? Harlan unwraps his bread from the towel and displays it to the admiring women. I baked it all by myself. We came to show Mama. Now that looks downright professional. Can we try some? Girls, shall we do a little taste test? The women nod and smile and Harlan hands out pieces of his loaf. They hug and kiss and muss his hair. Harlan squirms in their arms. He's not used to this much affection. The last woman pops the hunk of bread in her mouth and points to the far end of the factory where Harlan's mother is peeling tomatoes. Mm, Your mama's over there. She'll be so proud of you. Harlan trots across the factory floor, holding the remains of the loaf above his head like a trophy. Look, mama, I just made this bread just like you taught me. His mother glances up from the tomato she's peeling. She could lose her job if the foreman spots her kids here. She shakes her head angrily at her son. Harland, be quiet. What are you doing here? And look at your filthy feet. I told you to take care of your brother and sister, not drag them all over creation. Now go home before I get fired. The joy drains from Harland's face. The rare times he's gone to school, he wasn't any good at it. The only things he has a knack for are cooking and baking. But not even that seems to please his mother. He turns around and trudges home with his siblings, his stomach in knots. Waves of anger and shame wash over him. It's the first in a life full of disappointing failures, but rejection, wrenching poverty and neglect will forge a fierce ambition in Harlan Sanders. It will turn him into a wildly original entrepreneur and eventually a global icon. But the same tough times that create the Colonel will fire up ambition in another young man, Truett Cathy, the future founder of Chick-fil-A. From Wondery, I'm David Brown, and this is Business Wars. On the last episode, Harlan Sanders discovered he had a profitable knack for making fried chicken. And to make sure it gets noticed, he's created a colorful alter ego, the Kentucky Colonel. Now we're going back to Harlan Sanders' roots, to an era when a visit to a restaurant was out of reach for most thrifty Americans. Sanders is dreaming big, 
but so are other unseen rivals. Tough times will test their resolve and ingenuity because they're all about to hit some deep potholes on the road to success. This is episode two, Fast Fists and Failure. It's summer, 1900, outside of Henryville, Kentucky, a farm on the edge of town. Ten-year-old Harlan Sanders lies on his back in the cool grass and squints up at the clouds. One looks just like a squirrel with a curled tail. He's supposed to be gathering brush from the nearby field. His mother has hired him out to a farmer for two dollars a month, room and board included. Harlan takes a big whiff of clover and listens to the song sparrows in the windbreak. He sits up to look around for rabbits and spots the farmer rounding the corner. There you are, you good-for-nothing rascal. You've been out here a whole month, and it looks like you haven't picked up a goddamn stick. I've had it. You're coming back to the house with me. Now. The boy hauls himself up and trudges behind the farmer to the farmhouse. In the kitchen, the farmer reaches into a cookie jar and pulls out a couple of crumpled bills. He hands them to Harlan. I should be sending you home empty-handed. But here's the two dollars I told your ma I'd pay you. But you get your things and go. You're not worth a doggone, boy. Harlan stuffs his extra shirt and socks in a paper bag and drags his heels the whole seven miles back home. He dreads facing his mother. He tiptoes in the back door. His mother is sitting at the kitchen table reading the Bible. She gives him a hard look. What are you doing home, son? Harlan stares down at his feet. I, uh, I tried to clear scrub wood for Mr. Norris, but stumps are hard to dig out, and sometimes I got tired, and, well, he didn't like the work I did, so he let me go. Harlan's mother stands up, grasps Harlan by the shoulders, and gives him a good shake. Here I am, left alone with three children to support, and you're the man of the house. But I guess I'll never be able to count on you. Looks like you'll never amount to anything. His mother's words will haunt Harlan Sanders for the rest of his life. It's 1915, a blistering summer day in Little Rock, Arkansas. Harlan Sanders stands on the stony track bed of the railway just outside of town. He's 25 years old and wiry from manual labor. It's been a decade since he left home. He's had jobs as a farmhand, a streetcar fare conductor, and a blacksmith's helper. Now, he's working the rails as a fireman, stoking the hungry flames with coal on a local passenger train that's pulled to the side to wait for an express train to pass. He leans on his shovel, takes out his handkerchief, and wipes grimy sweat off his brow. Today, the Hot Springs Limited is late. Sanders squints down the tracks and sees something rounding the curve. But it's not a train. It's a man walking on the side of the rail bed. Then he sees more people, some carrying suitcases. He turns to another fireman sitting on a train step having a smoke. Hey, Joe, look at those people heading our way. What's going on? The man flicks his cigarette butt into the dirt. The station master said there's a wreck. The Limited took a turn too fast. Some passengers got hurt. Sanders' pulse quickens. He's got a wife now and two kids. At night, he's been taking a legal correspondence course. He doesn't want to shovel coal the rest of his life. He senses an opportunity that could change everything. He knows when an accident happens, the railroad quickly dispatches a claims adjuster to the scene. Harlan figures if he can get to the injured parties before the adjuster persuades them to sign away their rights to sue, then he can represent them in court. It's a risky scheme, and he needs help. Sanders turns to the man sitting nearby. Hey, did you bring a change of clothes with you? I'll give you a dollar for a fresh shirt. I need something presentable right now. The man's happy to make some quick cash and fetches his satchel. In the caboose, Sanders changes into a white shirt and fresh wool pants and grabs some official-looking forms from the law school workbook he keeps in his bag. 
Harlan rushes inside the station where the first accident victims are streaming in. An attractive red-haired woman lies on a bench with her eyes closed. She presses a handkerchief to her bleeding forehead. Ma'am, I'm so sorry you've been hurt, but this is very important. The dazed woman's eyes flutter open. A railroad representative will get here soon, and he's going to try to get you to sign something saying the railroad isn't liable for your injury and you'll get paid nothing. You shouldn't sign it. But if you sign this paper here, I'll be your lawyer and I'll get you a good settlement in court. My name is Harlan Sanders, and I swear by my mother's life on that. She doesn't really know what he's talking about, but he looks like a fellow Irishman, and her head is pounding. All right, lad. Anything to stop you talking. Other victims overhear Sanders' pitch and follow her lead. The claims adjuster arrives and sees Sanders working the waiting room, so he starts on the other side. They meet in the middle. The adjuster glares at Sanders. Son, I don't know who you are, but you should know you just made an enemy of the railroad. Sanders' days as a railroad man are officially behind him. With just a smattering of legal knowledge, he soon manages to win some hefty awards for his first clients. But his days as a lawyer are numbered. One year later, in Little Rock, Arkansas, a black-robed judge strides into the county courthouse and takes his seat on the bench. I hereby call the court to order. I've reached my decision in the case of Murphy versus the Arkansas Central Railroad, and I find for the plaintiff, George D. Murphy. The railroad's representative is ordered to hand over the sum of $200 in damages to Mr. Murphy's attorney, Mr. Harlan Sanders. Sanders' client angrily leaps to his feet. Hell no, Judge. That check should go to me, not my lawyer. Order. Order in the court. Mr. Murphy, you will abide by the rules of this court. But now Sanders stands up and turns to his client. Are you saying I'm a cheat? I won this goddamn case for you fair and square, and now you owe me 50 bucks out of the settlement for my fee like we agreed. First I get paid, and then you get paid, you slippery son of a bitch. Order! There will be order! But Sanders' client doesn't back down. Why should I trust you anyways? Everybody knows you have your hand up the skirt of every fast woman in town. That pushes Sanders over the edge. He punches his client in the jaw, sending the man staggering back. He grabs his chair and throws it at Sanders. The two men rush at each other like bulls and topple over in a heap on the floor. Order! Order! Deputies pull the two men apart. Because Sanders threw the first punch, they arrest him on the spot. And although he eventually beats the assault charge, the courthouse brawl destroys his reputation and his practice. Harland is 31 years old. He's been working for 20 years and has had about as many jobs. Now, he has three children to support, and he's nearly broke. Sanders doesn't have a single lead on work, and his time is running short. Because a future rival is already learning valuable lessons about how to make a buck, even in the darkest of times. In the 90s, your business needed an email address. By the 2000s, you needed a website. By 2010, you got ahead by having a social media presence. And I'm here to tell you that in 2021, your business needs to be texting. I mean, when I find a business can text, I'm going to use that business because it's more convenient for me. And Podium is the messaging platform to power your business because it helps you reach your customers wherever they are. Business messaging with Podium helps you gain reviews, collect payments, communicate with customers, and capture leads, all from a single inbox. Listen to these glowing endorsements. RPM Alamo used Podium and increased business by 20%. The owner said, we've generated more revenue, decreased vacancy rates, and pulled in more leads than we could have in multiple years. That is priceless. Or how about this from The Bridal Collection? They processed over $200,000 in no-contact payments. The owner said, we don't have to take credit cards into the store. We can do it completely remotely. Podium has been a godsend for us in this journey. 
Find out how Podium can help your business reach more customers. Get started free today at podium.com slash BW. That's podium.com slash BW. It's a sweltering summer day in 1929, Atlanta. Eight-year-old Truett Cathy heaves a big block of ice onto the kitchen table. He places a chisel on top of the block, picks up a hammer, and delicately taps. He's making ice chips for a Coca-Cola stand. At the kitchen counter, his mother seasons chicken pieces for the next day's dinner. She puts down the shakers and turns to Truett. Son? Be sure to leave me enough ice to keep the ice box cold. I've got to put the chicken in and let it sit overnight for tomorrow's dinner. Truett's mother runs a boarding house to keep their family of nine afloat. Years before, fire and an infestation of boll weevils destroyed the family farm and sent them into debt. Now, his father sells life insurance. But few people can afford to buy policies or keep up with the premiums since the Depression began. The family badly needs whatever cash Truett can earn, even if it's just a few cents from a drink stand. Truett reaches up and stands on tiptoe to get a better angle on the chisel. Don't worry, Mama. I won't use it all. His mother puts the chicken in the fridge and takes out a package of stewing beef for tonight's meal. She sets it on the cutting board and picks up a knife to cube it. True, why are you setting up a stand anyway? You were doing so well selling Cokes door to door. A couple of my customers told me they'd buy Cokes from me every day if they were in cups with ice instead of lukewarm in bottles. That's what gave me the idea. But Mama, I was wondering, why do you always chill the chicken for a day before you fry it? His mother smiles at her budding chef. She would always helps her shuck corn, shell peas, and wash dishes. He can already make a mean pot roast. Well, that way the seasoning has longer to seep into the meat, and the skin dries out and crisps up better when you fry it. And to keep the meat juicy, you should put a lid on the skillet. That helps steam the chicken while it's cooking. I'll show you tomorrow. Truett nods. He likes cooking and feeding people. It makes him happy. There hasn't been much happiness in the family since the farm went under. His father has started laying into him and his siblings with a razor strap. Truett lugs the remaining ice block back to the fridge and runs out the door with his bowl of quickly melting chips. He sees a customer staring at the tin sign on his stand. The sign came directly from Coca-Cola headquarters. It shows a man handing a frosty bottle of Coke to a beautiful woman in a white hat. Beads of sweat glisten on the customer's forehead. Truett has a hunch this soda business is going to work out. Soon, the stand pulls in so much traffic on their busy street that Truett buys cases of Coke wholesale off the delivery truck. Profits double. He expands his line to new grape and orange crush and offers free sodas to the ice man in exchange for any of his broken ice blocks. Before the end of the summer, he's clearing more money a week than his father ever did selling insurance. His parents welcome the cash, but Truett notices his father talks to him less than ever. And when anybody in the family gets the slightest bit sassy, he's even more vicious with the strap. Despite his soda earnings, the family falls further into debt. It's 1939 in Atlanta at an apartment building in Techwood Homes, the nation's first federally subsidized housing project. Truett pulls an Atlanta journal out of his canvas newsboy bag. The headlines are all about the war in Europe. He places it on the doormat of apartment 2D and arranges it neatly, face up, and with the headlines facing the door. That's how 2D likes it. Truett is 18 now and lanky from daily deliveries to the huge complex. He knows all of his customers in the housing project because he's lived there with his family since it was built four years ago. He and his brother Ben have been in charge of the paper route since they moved in. A man with gray hair and a cane opens the door of apartment 2F and eases himself stiffly down onto a rocking chair in the hall. Hi, True. You're right on time. I brewed some fresh coffee and I'm itching to read the sports page. 
Now, would you mind fetching my cup from the counter for me? I can't manage it with a cane. Truett hands him a paper. Sure thing, Mr. Cullen. This kind of personal service wins the brothers loyal customers. Between them, they make nearly enough to pay the family's rent. The only drawback is that Truett has to deliver papers on Sundays. It's a major conflict for him as a devout Christian. His faith has sustained him through his family's hardships and his father's abuse. He vows that when he starts his own business, and he's sure he will, he'll always close to observe the Lord's Day. But first, he has to make it through World War II. In the next episode, Colonel Sanders takes his fried chicken show on the road to stave off bankruptcy. And Truett Cathy lucks into a windfall he turns into solid southern fried gold. From Wondery, this is episode two of KFC vs. Chick-fil-A for Business Wars. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review, and be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen one week early and ad-free. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. There's another way you can support the show, and that's by filling out a small survey at wondery.com survey and tell us which business stories you'd like to hear. A quick note about recreations in this episode. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said. Those scenes are dramatizations, but they are based on historical research. And we use many sources when researching our stories. But we especially recommend Josh Ozersky's Colonel Sanders and the American Dream and Secret Recipe by Robert Darden. I'm your host, David Brown. Barbara Bogave wrote this story. Karen Lowe is our senior producer and editor. Edited and produced by Emily Frost. Voice acting by Michelle Phillippe. Sound design by Kyle Randall. Kate Young is our associate producer. Our executive producers are Jenny Lauer Beckman and Marshall Louie. Created by Hernan Lopez for Wondering.